I invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to read to you verses 13 and 14. Paul writes, In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Now tonight as we continue our study of Ephesians chapter 1, this opening section of Ephesians, what's known as Paul's doxology of praise, we have come to these, these closing verses in which we are going to see one of the roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our salvation, certainly not the only role he plays, but one of the roles, having already told us that in eternity past, God the Father chose us for salvation and that presently, today, right now, we experience salvation because God the Son has redeemed us. Paul is now going to conclude this very long run-on sentence that began in verse 3. He's going to conclude this passage by telling us that there is a future aspect to our salvation and that future aspect is guaranteed by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, I, I remind you that in this section, Paul has been teaching the Ephesians about this great doctrine known as redemption, in which Jesus, by his blood, has purchased us. That's what redemption means, so that we can be saved, and we are saved, and we are forgiven of our sins, and he paid for this ransom. He paid the ransom price with his own blood, which satisfied completely the justice of God the Father, so that we have been set free from the bondage of sin. That is redemption. Paul began this teaching about redemption in verse 7. If you notice, verse 7 says this, in him, speaking of Christ, we have redemption through his blood. And then the apostle continued, he didn't stop, he continued teaching about redemption for the remainder of this opening section. So from verse 7 all the way now to verse 14, he's still speaking about redemption. He has told us that redemption brings with it certain, certain things. It brings with it the forgiveness of our sins. It brings with it a mind that God gives us a mind to have wisdom so that we understand the doctrine of redemption and insight so that we now know how to apply certain redemptive truths and when we find ourselves in situations, uh, knowing how free we are, knowing how far to go with our freedom, knowing not to abuse our freedom, that, that type of of information. Now last Sunday we began to look at more truths related to redemption but with a little different emphasis than what we've seen before. Starting with verse 11 Paul focuses on introducing something that he has never said before not in this letter. It was far into the thinking of the early Christians and that is this. This is what he's about to teach that Jewish believers in Christ and Gentile believers in Christ have absolutely no spiritual distinctions. There is no difference. They are both full-scale members of the body of Christ with the exact same standing before God. Now, you may not think that this is very relevant, that this is important, but when we get to chapters 2 and 3, there are some things that I want to bring out that are very important. Uh, for example, there's a whole movement of Jewish believers uh, called Messianic Synagogism, Messianic Judaism. We're going to touch on that. Is it valid to have a Jewish church? Is it valid to have a Gentile church? Is it valid to have a, a black church? Is it valid to have a white church? We're going to look at that. So this is very relevant. This is where Paul introduces this truth. He teaches this critical truth by explaining that redemption is something that is experienced by all who trust Christ for salvation, regardless of whether or not they are Jewish or Gentile. And you can see how Paul does this. He does this, and I want you to notice that he makes a reference to different groups, different groups of people in these verses, while at the same time teaching them that they are part of this great plan of redemption. Remember, this is foreign-sounding stuff to the first century 
individual, especially to the Jewish believer who did look down upon Gentiles and considered them second rate, if at all they were in the body of Christ, and Gentiles who wondered, could they actually be part of God's people? Now, we saw in our last study that the apostle began to make this point by explaining in verse 11 that all believers are the redeemed possession of Christ. Starting at the very end of verse 10 and then verse 11, he says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, as I mentioned last week, there are two ways that this verse can be translated. Two perfectly legitimate ways in the Greek language. But they, they have completely opposite meanings. Either Paul is saying that we have an inheritance because we have Christ. Or he's saying that we are Christ's inheritance because he has us. Now, as I told you last week, both are taught in scripture. That's not the issue. Both of these truths are taught in the New Testament, but only one of them is what Paul means here. So it seems to me that the weight of evidence based on the context of these verses is that the apostle is stating that because of Christ's redemption, we have become his purchased possession. After all, that is what redemption means. We've become his possession. And the primary reason I hold to this view is because Paul is about to make the argument that Gentile believers in Christ are just as much the Lord's possession as Jewish believers are in Christ. And this concept of being the Lord's inheritance, his possession, is the very language often used in the Bible to speak of Israel as God's inheritance. I mentioned some of these verses last week. But the Bible often speaks of Israel, the Jewish people, as God's inheritance, his portion, his possession. And so, by using the same kind of, if you will, inheritance language, Paul seems to be bringing out the truth that not only is Israel God's possession, but all believers today, whether Jewish or Gentile, are part of Christ's inheritance. That is the language of inheritance that is so common in the Old Testament. That's why he mentions Jewish believers as a group in verse 12, and then he mentions in verse 13 Gentile believers. I point this out because it's not always that easy to notice, but I want you to see how he puts it in verse 12. He says, to the end, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Now he mentions a group, we who were the first to hope in Christ. Who is he referring to? I take it he's referring To Jewish people, they were the first of all people groups to come to faith in Christ. Why? Because in the book of Acts, Jesus had told his disciples, first you begin, after I leave and you receive the Holy Spirit, first you begin to be witnesses in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So, the gospel message first went to the Jewish people, and I might add exclusively to the Jewish people at first. But it didn't stop with Jewish people. The early Christians, as you know, eventually took the gospel to the Gentile world all around the Roman Empire. And there were many former pagans who embraced Jesus as their savior. And that's what Paul proceeds to say in verse 13. Notice the very beginning of verse 13. He says, in him, you also, there's the distinction, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. Now let's stop here and consider what Paul's actually saying. Notice, he calls the Ephesians, who were predominantly Gentile, he calls them you also. In other words, in contrast to Jewish believers, who he called in verse 12, We who were the first to hope in Christ, he includes himself in that, being Jewish. In contrast to Jewish believers, these Gentile believers are referred to as you also. Paul's point in referring to them as you also is to say that just like Jewish believers, those who believed in Christ after hearing the message of the gospel, you also believed just like 
like they did. Now, I want to stop here for a few moments to point out something that is most important. With all that Paul has said in this passage about God's sovereignty, election, predestination, it's easy to overlook what the apostle says about our role in salvation, and we have a role in salvation. Notice that Paul says in verse 13 that after listening to the message of truth, which he explains as the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. Don't overlook this. The apostle makes it very clear that the way to be saved is that you must hear the gospel and you must believe it. No one is saved just because they are elect. They, the elect are always, always come to faith in Christ, but you are saved upon hearing the gospel and believing it. The elect will always have that happen. But don't overlook human responsibility. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word about Christ. And the word about Christ that Paul is referring to is the gospel, the good news that God has provided salvation by sending his son to be an atoning sacrifice by bearing the Father's wrath in the place of sinners. And those who trust, that's what it means to believe, trusting Christ work on the cross alone for their salvation, by believing him, they are saved from divine wrath. This is what the Ephesian Gentiles did. They heard about Jesus. How did they hear about Jesus? Because the Apostle Paul came to Ephesus and proclaimed Christ. There were also others who were there too. Apollos, a man named Apollos was there. The Bible says he was a, a Jewish man, mighty in the scriptures. They heard about Christ because the Christians proclaimed Christ to them and they believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So what this tells us, folks, is that the doctrines of election and divine sovereignty do not negate the need for believers to evangelize people and urge them to trust Christ as Savior. John Stott, I think, has a very important word on this when he states, and I quote, let no one say that the doctrine of election by the sovereign will and mercy of God, mysterious as it is, makes either evangelism or faith unnecessary. The opposite is the case. It's only because of God's gracious will to save that evangelism has any hope of success and faith becomes possible. The preaching of the gospel is the very means that God has appointed by which he delivers from blindness and bondage those whom he chose in Christ before the foundation of the world, sets them to believe in Jesus, and so causes his will to be done. So it's important then for us to keep in mind that we who believe in God's sovereignty, we who would even call ourselves Calvinists, we who believe in the doctrine of election, must not become unbalanced in our Christian lives to the point where we stop evangelizing because we conclude, look, God is going to save whom he elects, so why do I need to evangelize? We evangelize because God not only ordains people to salvation, he ordains the means by which they come to faith in him. Obedience to the Lord is, his, is the issue here. As John Stott points out, as I just said, God not only chooses the elect, but he has chosen the preaching of the gospel by the very means that the elect come to faith in Christ. So this is the balance. So believe in election. We should. It's taught in the scripture. But share the gospel too. And those who are elect will eventually be responsive and believe in Christ. Now it's important that we not lose sight of, of the main point that Paul is making in verse 13. The primary point that the apostle is making is that it's not only Jewish people, Jewish believers, who are Christ's redeemed possession, his inheritance, but Gentiles also who believe the gospel are just as much the redeemed possession of Christ as their Jewish counterparts. That's the primary point that he's making. His teaching, as I remind you, was something brand new is teaching that Gentiles and, and Jews could be saved on the same level and placed in the body of Christ, that was something absolutely previously unheard of. The thought that people who were raised in darkness, the darkness of paganism, you read chapter 4 and how Paul describes paganism, the lostness of it, 
chapter 2, he says, you were previously without hope in the world. How they could come out of paganism and now be fellow citizens with the saints, along with enlightened Jewish people who had the scriptures all of these years. That's an astounding teaching. That's what Paul is teaching here. So it's not unusual to imagine then that these Gentiles at Ephesus, and if it was a circular letter, then other Gentiles and other local churches would be reading this and, and would want some type of assurance. Is this really the case? Is, what, what kind of a guarantee can you give me, Paul, that what you're saying is true, that, that we're saved, we're saved just like Jewish people who believe in Christ, that we too are saved? Apparently, that's exactly what they were thinking. Apparently, that's exactly what they were looking for because immediately after telling them that they were, number one, Christ's redeemed possession, Paul tells them another truth about redemption designed to give them assurance of their salvation. He tells them about, number two, the proof of their redemption, the proof of it. Verse 13 again, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, Paul says that at the time they believed the message of the truth, and, he, and, and some translate this after, but it is at the time, not later, but at the time that they believed the message of the gospel of salvation in Christ, they, these Gentiles, were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And what does that mean? Well, what is a seal? A seal is, a, is an official mark of something, like a document or a contract or a letter. It's usually made from hot wax and then pressed down on the paper with a signet ring. So a seal then, although it had a number of uses, primarily was a sign of ownership and authenticity. A sign of ownership and authenticity. It was a proof then that the item, this item that, that had the seal, the stamp on it, that it belonged to the person who sealed it. That's, that's the basic meaning and usage of a seal. Now Paul is teaching, note this, these Ephesian Gentiles, that at the moment they believed in Christ, God gave them the Holy Spirit who is the third person of the Trinity. God gave them the Holy Spirit as the seal the proof that they belonged to him. They belonged to Jesus Christ just as much as Jewish people who believed in Jesus belonged to him. That's the point Paul is making. See, the Bible teaches that one of the proofs that we are saved is that the Holy Spirit indwells us. How do we know that the Spirit of God indwells us? It's not so much a feeling. It's not an emotion. The Holy Spirit is in a believer whether he feels it, it feels him or not. But listen to this. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer the very moment that we're saved. Usually we don't know that that's happened at the time, but this is what the Bible teaches. Romans 8, 9, Paul says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, and he's using Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ synonymously, he does not belong to him. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? The apostle teaches, the word of God teaches that every believer has the spirit of God indwelling them. As one person so ably put it they said when God gives us his Holy Spirit it's as if he stamps us with a seal that reads this person belongs to me and is an authentic citizen of my divine kingdom and member of my divine family see one of the ways that these early Jewish believers knew that salvation had now come to the Gentiles those who believed in Christ was that the Holy Spirit was given to them let me show you this Acts chapter 10 this is the story while you turn there, I'll give you the background. Peter is in Joppa. He has been, he has seen this trance, this vision of all these animals on a sheet of paper that God says, arise, Peter, kill and eat. 
And many of these animals are non-kosher animals. And Peter, who always had this kind of audacity, says to the Lord, no, Lord, never. I, I, I have never eaten anything unclean, never eaten anything non-kosher. But in the meantime, there's a man, a centurion, a Gentile, named Cornelius, who is at Caesarea. And an angel appears to him and says, go call for Peter, and, he, and he's going to come and speak to you. Now, Cornelius doesn't know what this is about. Cornelius is a Gentile who is a proselyte, meaning he believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, eventually, Peter comes to the home of Cornelius. He has his whole family and other servants are gathered and he preaches the gospel. And he understands that what God was telling him through this vision is that as far as God is concerned, he shows no partiality of people. Gentiles can be saved. So Peter proclaims the gospel. Now we read in Acts 10, verse 1. Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. And verse 44 and on says, while Peter was still speaking, now he's proclaimed the gospel, I just didn't read it all to you, Peter was still speaking these words, these words of what? These words about Christ. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers, that means Jewish believers, who came with Peter were amazed. Why were they amazed? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know this? Well, they were hearing them speak with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? Peter is recognizing that they are believers because the Holy Spirit has come upon them. And that's the initial evidence that he saw and all these Jewish believers saw that they had received the Holy Spirit was that they spoke in tongues. Now, it's not part of our study here to go into that. In the future, I hope in the mornings to eventually get to the book of Acts and we'll deal more thoroughly with tongues. But suffice it to say that, that tongues, biblical tongues in the first century, it was a human language that had never been taught somebody. They just knew it. They didn't go to school. They hadn't been tutored. It was a human language. It was not ecstatic utterance. It was not a, a gibberish type of thing that nobody understands. It was a human language. That was a sign in that day, and it was a sign gift that I don't believe exists today, because I don't think we need that, that they had received the Holy Spirit. Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 14, it's not needed today. It was a sign. Once something has been fulfilled, you don't need a sign. But it was a sign then. That was a sign in that day that they had received the Holy Spirit. And later, Peter mentions, this is important, in the Jerusalem Council. Remember, in Acts 15, there were some Jewish people believers who said we don't think that Gentiles can be saved apart from keeping the law of Moses and Peter mentions in that Jerusalem council that these Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit and he says it to prove that they were saved by God's grace just as the Jewish believers were saved they didn't need to keep the law of Moses the Jewish believers were not saved by keeping the law of Moses nobody is saved by keeping the law of Moses Acts chapter 15 Starting at verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And, and let me stop here and say the reason that this hadn't come up earlier is because you didn't have Gentile believers earlier. And Jewish believers ordinarily just kept the, the festivals and the, they, they were circumcised already. They didn't have to think this thing through. That's the whole point of Paul's letter to the Galatians. That was all new. The Jewish believers lived like this, not to be saved, but they already lived like that, the circumcision, the feast, the eating a certain way. Now that you had Gentiles, what are we going to do with them? They're not used to this. So that's the background. So the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after there had been much debate, now notice it's Peter. Peter stood up and said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. Now notice, Peter says the evidence, the proof that they are saved is that God gave them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us, between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now the way we know today 
that we have the Holy Spirit in us is not by, not by tongues, but by the way that God works in our lives, sanctifying us, helping us to grow in Christ, growing more and more to be like Jesus. That's how you know the Holy Spirit indwells you. And I want to show you this, Romans chapter 8. I think this is a misunderstood passage of Scripture, starting in verse 13. Paul says, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. He's talking about those who are not saved. Living according to the flesh means living as an unconverted individual. You have to die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For, and now he explains, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. <coughs> the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, we look at this and we say, Paul speaks of the leading of the Spirit. All who are being led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. What is he talking about? Is the leading of the Spirit of God telling you, go here, go there? I don't think that's at all what he's saying. What is the leading of the Spirit of God? The leading of the Spirit of God is that he leads you to put to death the deeds of the body. That's what Paul's talking about. If the Spirit of God lives in you, he is leading you to obedience. He's leading you to say no to the lusts of the flesh. To not indulge in the habits that you used to indulge in. That's how you know you're a believer. That's how the Spirit of God leads us. He convicts us of sin. He leads us in righteousness. That's the leading that Paul is talking about. Notice again what he said. For if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you'll live for all who are being led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. Those who are being led by God are those who are putting to death the deeds of of the body. He's not talking about perfection, but he's talking about sanctification in your life, some spiritual growth in your life. And when that happens, the Spirit of God testifies within you. You are a believer. You see spiritual growth. You see things happening in your life. That's the leading of the Spirit of God. It's sanctification. It's the same point of Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So what is Paul saying? If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you will bear the fruit of these godly character qualities. He's not talking about fruit to the extreme. Some, some believers bear more fruit than others. Some bear less. But all believers bear some fruit, character qualities. That is to say that all believers do grow in Christ. If you can say, I've been a believer since I've been 10 years old, and now you're adult, an adult well into your mid-years, mid-life, but you see no growth, you're not a believer. It can't be that there's 30, 40 years of no growth. There's going to be some growth because the Holy Spirit in you will produce growth. But if there's never any growth, never that it means that one is not a Christian. But Paul knew that these Gentile believers at Ephesus were Christians. He knew that they were growing in Christ. He knew them personally. He knew that they came out of paganism. He saw their lives change. That they had been transformed. He talks to them in chapter 4 about putting off and putting on, but he had seen that they had already done a lot of that. He was encouraging to do more. They put off old habits. They were obedient. And the reason for this growth spiritually is that they had been sealed with the Holy Spirit as proof that they belonged to Christ. But the Holy Spirit isn't only the proof of our redemption. As Paul concludes this section in his letter, he gives us one more truth about redemption. He tells us that the Holy Spirit is the promise of our redemption, or perhaps better to say he is the promise of our full redemption. Verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession 
to the praise of his glory. Still speaking about the Holy Spirit, Paul says that he is given, meaning the Spirit is given, as a pledge of our inheritance. Now, what does he mean by this? Well, <clears throat> this Greek word pledge is a word that in Paul's day, it meant a deposit, a down payment, a really a first installment, a, a promise that more was to come, just as we give a down payment now. I'll pay you later, but here's a down payment that secures what I want. It's interesting, in later Greek, this word, and in fact, I think it's still used this way today, it's used, it was used as an engagement ring, this very word. Because when someone gives an engagement ring, they are making a promise that there is more to come called marriage. That's exactly what Paul means when he speaks of the Holy Spirit as the pledge of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit's presence in our lives not only proves that we have been redeemed, but it is God's pledge to us that there is more to come concerning our inheritance and our redemption. In other words, the Holy Spirit indwelling us now is a foretaste, is a foretaste that in the future we are going to experience the fullness of being in Christ and the fullness of being redeemed. And what does the fullness of our inheritance entail? Well, Paul tells us in the very last phrase, or I should say the middle phrase of verse 14, there is still a last phrase, he says, with a view of the redemption of God's own possession. Right now, we are the Lord's redeemed possession. That's the point of redemption. We belong to him. However, although our souls have been redeemed, our bodies have not yet been redeemed. We're not taking this body to heaven. Thank God. But the body will be changed. There will be the fullness of redemption when Christ comes for us and gives us a new, glorified, resurrected body. This is what Paul will refer to in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, when he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform, note this, the body of our humble state, that's our bodies now. He'll transform that into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So when people say, well, how, how's he going to give a resurrected body when it's uh, been cremated? It's uh, been burned at the stake as martyrs have. It's disintegrated. Well, right here, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself, even ashes. 1 Corinthians 15, 53 says this, this corruptible, meaning this body, must put on incorruption. This mortal, meaning this mortal body, must put on immortality, a new body. John tells us in 1 John 3, 2, that when we see him, we shall be like him. We'll be like Christ in terms of a glorified body. See, right now, as God's redeemed people, we have been set free from the penalty and the power of sin. But when Christ comes for us, we will be released from the very presence of sin. Right now, the fruit of godly character that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives, folks, it's just a foretaste of things to come. It's a foretaste. It's a pledge that there's more to come, and it actually gets better. When Jesus comes for us, our character will be just like his, conformed perfectly to the image of Christ. We will never be Christ. We are mere creatures. But our character will be like his because then we will experience the fullness or the completion of our redemption. And the point that the apostle is making is that the Spirit of God is every believer's assurance, both Jewish and Gentile believers, so that in the future we know that we will experience our complete inheritance when we receive new redeemed body. Praise God, that day is coming. Now, why has God done all of this? Let's put this all together. Start in verse 3. Why has he chosen us in Christ? Why has he redeemed us? Why has he predestined us? Why has he given us the, the Holy Spirit who produces growth in us? 
and pledges that there's more to come and why someday will he perfect us in Christ. There's only one reason. One reason that rises above all other reasons. Look at the end of verse 14. He has said this throughout this section to the praise of his glory. That's why. We have been chosen to be his people for all of eternity so that for all of eternity we will be praising his glory. His glory essentially means who he is. That's why. See, salvation from beginning to end, it's of the Lord. It's of the Lord. The Father chose us. The Son redeemed us. The Spirit guarantees the fullness of the Son's redemption. So all that's left for us to do when you learn this is just worship God. Don't, don't debate election. Don't debate Calvinism. Just enjoy it. Worship God. See, only God could pull off a plan like this to take fallen, selfish, depraved people and make us his own prized possession, those who praise him instead of praising themselves, because that's what we used to do. Now, maybe, maybe we can understand a little bit better why Paul, though locked up in a prison when he wrote this, was nonetheless praising God. This is why. He wasn't feeling sorry for himself. Paul's mind was in the heavenlies thinking about this. That's where ours need, needs to be as well. Now, if you still don't know Christ after all of this, don't let another day go by. Don't let another day go by. Having heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, do what the Ephesians did. Believe on Christ and be set free from your sin. Let's bow for prayer. Father, what a privilege you've given us as a church family to study this passage of scripture. So profound, so deep, so rich. Lord, it's, it's still somewhat mysterious to us. We can fathom some of it, but some of it is just too deep to, to fully grasp. But thank you that you've given us a mind that we can understand the basic truths of redemption. And you've given us insight, Lord. And we thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit. We often don't think about him we often overlook his ministry, but how precious it is to know that he leads us to obedience. He produces Christ-likeness in us. And though we get frustrated with our lack of growth, it's only because we really do want to grow. And because we have grown. We just don't grow as fast as we'd like to grow. But thank you for every believer here who is putting to death the deeds of the body desiring to grow in you, desiring to be more Christ-like, confessing their sins, dealing with attitudes, repenting, working on being more loving and kind and joyful and, and obedient and compassionate and all of those virtues. Lord, we look forward to the day when we see you and we'll be just like you. Until that time, Lord, help us to be obedient to you. And help us, Lord, to remember the balance that we are to share the gospel and we are to evangelize, and we are to have a missions ministry here, and we are to encourage our missionaries and send them out, and we are to spread the gospel, knowing full well that you ordain, that some will believe, and even if they don't, even if, if many who we speak to don't believe because they've not been chosen, we are still to be obedient to you, to share the word. Now I pray, Lord, if there are some here without Christ, work in their hearts, show them that, Show them perhaps that there's never been any growth in their lives, that they are deceiving themselves, thinking that they're Christians when they're not. But we pray that no one will have assurance problems who, uh, who really do know you, that they would be assured knowing that there is a desire to grow. And if there is a desire to grow and honor you, it's because the Spirit of God is there. So Lord, we ask you to take your word and apply it as you see fit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful evening. You're dismissed.